So after the genocide, things were very, very tough. As you can imagine, I was a child. I was five years old. Yeah. And I had just lost my mom and my dad, my sisters. We lost everything. Our house got burned. You know, I saw the house and I gave away all my belongings. And I packed up and I came to Kigali. I came to Rwanda. I said it's not true. I can be gay because you okay, know it's yeah. against the Bible. Yeah. Jesus doesn't love gay people. Uh, that's yeah. what I grew up being told, and like, I'm committing sin. So, you know, do the work. Do the work. Do it very well. And uh, and and for sure, send send me a message. Send me your your. Welcome back, my wonderful peoples. Today's guests is a brother, a fellow Rwandan, with a somewhat similar story to mine. We were both born and raised in Rwanda around the same time. After the 1994 genocide against the Tutsis, we fled to Congo, formerly known as Zaire, and Zambia. After that, I moved to the Netherlands in Europe, and he moved to America. The biggest difference between him and I, though, is that he did all of that after experiencing the murder of his mother with his own two eyes. Later, his father and two sisters got murdered as well. He experienced abuse at a very young age, and at some point in his life, he almost committed suicide. Despite living such a roller coaster life, where he experienced so much pain and suffering and loss of family members at a young age, he still lives a pretty positive life. According to him, so much was given to him when he came to America that it inspired him to start a foundation where he would give to others. And this is how I met him. He reached out to me on Instagram, he said he liked my work, and before I knew it, I was taking pictures with a big check of 1 million Rwandan francs, around $1,000. Pretty awesome. In this video, we'll get to know the man behind this foundation. We'll talk about his life after losing his parents during the 1994 genocide, how he made his way to America, started from nothing to working in banking, public speaking, how he bought his first house and sold it right after to pursue his true passion of helping the less fortunate in America and Rwanda. We also talk about important topics that are less talked about in the Rwandan community, about childhood traumas, forgiveness and sexuality. Without further ado, my wonderful people, help me welcome... Ah. I lost electricity. Alright, let's continue. Without further ado, my wonderful people, help me welcoming the man who rose from the ashes as a genocide survivor, only to return winning in life as a fighter and a philanthropist, Daniel Trust. Okay, so let's start with you, Daniel. Uh, you were born in 1989. Actually, I'm older than you, man. You are? I'm, I'm 88. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Age is just a number, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I guess what... What's interesting about you, you are Rwandan, uh, yes. just like me, and yes. were born around the same time. Um, and while I mean, when I was growing up, because of my Rwandan history, people always had this kind of like subtlety towards me. They didn't know what question to ask me because they knew about the genocide yes. and they knew about my life. But you, on the other hand, you have been talking publicly about your life. Yes. Um, and to me, it's kind of like inspiring because most of the Rwandans I grew around with, they were quiet about their lives. So what made you start to want to talk about your life uh, so publicly? Yeah, totally. So when I was a junior in high school, I went to high school in the United States in a town called Bridgeport yes. uh, in Connecticut. And uh, when I was a junior, I was planning to... Uh, I was starting to plan for college, so yeah. I plan to college. And one of the things you have to do when you are plan to college is write an essay. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to tell the admissions officer about who you are and what makes you unique. Yeah. So I wrote an essay for my English class, and when my English teacher heard it, uh, read it, uh, and she was very inspired by it, and so she went and told everybody about the story. Ah. And uh, so. After that, there was uh, another local teacher who transferred from a high school to another school in another town, and she taught history, social studies. And uh, she asked me, my junior year, she asked me, Daniel, would you be interested in coming to talk to all our history classes? Uh, and that was like maybe, I think, 500 kids. This was wow. a big high school in Milford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very nervous. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was, I think... 18, 17, 18, 19, I can't remember the age, but uh, 
I I just she said just come and what you wrote in your essay just come and share share about your early life in Rwanda share about how you, you survived the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsis and how you uh, were able to come to the U.S. and start a life here just talk about it yeah. so I went on stage I shared my story and uh, afterwards the kids there to like oh my god i can't believe you went through that how are you so positive i can't yeah. believe you are here and so forth and it was it felt so good it was actually kind of ther- therapeutic for me yeah. because i had really as you said we don't really talk about about it much yeah, exactly. uh, publicly yeah. so it felt really good to be able to inspire people with my story mm-hmm. and how i had been able to move on yeah and uh, and one woman in the audience, uh, a mother of a student, yeah. uh, I told them that I liked eating uh, French fries, like frit. And yeah. uh, uh, she wrote me a letter mm-hmm. uh, telling me how that she had spent many years without speaking to her brother. Uh, but because after she heard me speak, uh, she went, they, they reconciled. Uh, oh, she wow. forgave him and they met. And she said, here's $5 so you can go buy uh, French fries for McDonald's. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so that was that was the beginning of the, me sharing my story publicly because I was like, I inspired people. I encouraged this woman to forgive uh, her brother and, uh, you know, they made, you know, they made up. Yeah. And and also I got lots of gifts from that speech. <laughs> <laughs> so you got well paid basically yes, yes, from yes, one speech. Yes, okay. Yes. So now I'm really curious about that essay. Must have, <laughs> must have been a hell of an essay if uh, you inspired the... Uh, to go to two schools to give uh, your, your speech. But it's yeah. so funny that you say it because I think most of us also when we were growing up, I, I also had to write an essay or, mm-hmm. but it was not an essay, it was, um, how do you call it, spread bird. Uh, you know, like we have to, you had to go play like a, a, a speech, a presentation, a presentation. And of course we we're all uh, out of like topics. So I decided to do a presentation about Rwanda myself. Yes. And that's the first time I was like 14 also, yeah. I actually dove into the, uh, the Rwandan history, mm-hmm. and, uh, and you're right, the, the, the teachers they loved it, they were yeah. like, oh, uh-huh. oh my God. Uh-huh. <laughs> you went through that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They were like, like so, oh. Yeah, like I see it on the news. Like, yeah, you know, exactly. Uh, but I think maybe it's because of the teachers, they were also older, so yes. they knew really what, to, what it meant. It yeah. was my classmates, they were like, okay, okay. nice presentation, <laughs> next. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so yeah, you alluded a little bit about it, so let's just go through it about, you know, your youth. You were born yeah. in Jiseni, in, yes. in, in, in Rwanda, born yes. and raised. Yes. And when the genocide against the Tutsis happened, you were five years That's old. Five years old, yes. Can you tell us a bit how you experienced that at that age? Because I know you've, you've taught this many times, so you can make it short if you want yeah. to elaborate however yeah, you want yeah. to. But just for context so that people know of your story, the ones who do not know your story yet. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll make it short. Uh, but uh, my family uh, experienced the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis. Uh, I lost my mom and dad, both they were killed. Yeah. I actually saw my mom uh, get killed. Yeah, uh, I read that too. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, when I went into hiding, I was also hiding with my two sisters. They also were killed. And we lost many members of our families. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I always say that by the grace of God, like many survivors, yeah. I survived. And uh, uh, I went, I lived in Congo mm-hmm. uh, for some time, just like you've lived in, Co- I think you, yeah. you lived in Congo. I also lived in Congo. <laughs> in, yes, in the Congo. Yes. And after the war, we came back to Rwanda. And, uh, and what, when, when, when was this? This was like maybe late, ni- late 1994 to early 1995. Okay. Really uh, right after. Yeah, that. yeah. We came back and uh, in 2001, uh, I left for Zambia and you also, again, I lived in Zambia. I also lived in Zambia. <laughs> Zambia yeah. yeah, and in Zambia, it's, uh, it's actually where I learned how to speak English because mm-hmm. I went there without knowing how to speak English. And uh, so I spent five, uh, four years uh, in Zambia yeah. and uh, in 2005, that's when I left for the, the United States. For the United States, okay. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of indeed a eerie similar stories yeah, indeed like, yeah. what, like what um, like we went through. So the, um, um, yeah, one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation with you right now, we are in the month of April, in the month we, we mourn basically as a whole country, as a whole run the nation of what happened in 1994. Yeah. And on the internet, there's a lot of stories of the genocide survivors, but mostly the grown-ups out there. Yes, so yes. the people who, maybe like your older sisters, yes. who had to fly. But the stories of the younger generation, so you, but even, you know, like I said, my girlfriend was born after the war, but they is also experienced somehow. Yes. 
Um, so I, I'm, I'm really interested in you growing up post genocide uh, and how how that was. Like, do you still remember when you, for example, went to Zambia? Yeah. But you still knew though, where, where you just came from. Yeah. Um, like how that was, and I also I I, I know from your story that you also um, said that when you came back to Rwanda for the first time, you did not have a good time. I would say because of the relatives that you you were put into to take care of you so how was that time for you growing up right after the genocide yeah it was very 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 tough yeah. uh, so after the genocide things were very very tough as you can imagine i was a child i was five years old yeah. and i had just lost my mom and my dad my sisters we lost everything our house yeah. got burned and uh, they uh, well first they stole all our belongings and mm. after they did that they burnt our house so we lost everything, everything yeah. so coming back you can imagine I mean I was very traumatized yeah. by everything that I had witnessed everything that I've been through and uh, my relatives didn't make things easier for me mm-hmm. uh, and there was a lot of uh, physical and uh, emotional abuse yeah. uh, and uh, you know, at the time, it really, you know, it really hurt me a lot because yeah. I couldn't understand how people can do that to me, mm-hmm. uh, especially knowing what I had, what I had experienced. Yeah. Uh, so I suffered uh, for pretty much my ad- adulthood. I was very sad and angry mm-hmm. about everything that had happened to me uh, through family members. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I came to learn that really everything that happened to me had really nothing to do with me. It had mm-hmm. everything to do with those people. Exactly. Uh, so. And that's really how I came into like uh, the process of like forgiving, you know, mm-hmm. uh, them, uh, my family members, yeah. uh, or the people who hurt my family, mm-hmm. and uh, really just you know also forgiving myself because sometimes I'll blame myself for certain things, yeah. uh, and uh, just really. Uh, those experiences as a child I used to be very sad all the time I would sit and cry and I would cry mm. uh, but as I, again as I started doing my talks and my speeches I would get to a part and I would become very emotional and I would cry mm. and you on know stage. on stage yeah okay. on, yeah on, yeah and and uh, and uh, uh, the audience actually really like they loved it they loved it because I was real like I've never been like I've like I, I've never been a fake person. Yeah. Like I'm straightforward. Like I don't like like going like yeah. this. Like you know. So if you invite me to tell my you know my story or to perform, I'm gonna it. I would just give it as it yeah. is. You know, and uh, so like as a child, you know, I was very traumatized. I was very uh, sad, angry. Mm-hmm. But as I've as I grew, it yeah. I was forgiving slowly by slowly. Yeah. And I could say like at now at 32, I'm very at peace. Yeah, like, no, at yeah, peace. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So would you say that now at 32, you still feel like you're still traumatized? Uh, n- not to, uh, it's always going to be there, you know, yeah. it's it's always going to be like, oh my God, you know, yeah. this really, you know, uh, but I think, I think now I've made peace with ha- what happened. So one of the things that have helped me, uh, I think, become successful, not only with my work, but also personally, is because that I've accepted, like, you know, I can go back and change that my mom and dad were killed and we yeah. lost everything. I can't change that. Yeah. You know, be, when I was younger, I used to uh, uh, complain and be sad because I would see some of my friends with their dads yeah. and and moms and so forth. Mm-hmm. But now I've accepted, you know what, I can't go and change anything that has happened in the past. Yeah. But you know what, I can, I, I have the uh, the power and to change what happens now and for the future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so well, like, that's a, a direct yeah. question then. Yes. Have you ever... S- sought out a professional help like a, a psychiatrist for the to deal with this uh, trauma or, or was it just public speaking for you so i as I, so okay that's a good question so i did seek professional help uh for a different kind of trauma i this happened when i was in college i was a sophomore i was a resident advisor at my college i went to a college called southern connecticut state university in new haven connecticut and when i was a sophomore I became very uh, aware that I was gay, mm. and uh, that really so bothered soft, me. Sophomore, yes, how old are you then? Uh, so possibly. I'm like 21, 22, okay. yeah, yeah. you know, 21, 22, and uh, really. I realized so for a very long time I grew up knowing it yeah. uh, but I always ignored it yeah. and all because well I ignored it because or said 
I said it's not true. I can be gay because you okay, know it's yeah. against the Bible. Yeah. Jesus doesn't love gay people. Uh, that's yeah. what I grew up being told, and like, I'm committing sin and so forth. So the idea that at that time I had like a you know somewhat started speaking publicly about yeah. my past as a Rwandan um, genocide survivor, yeah. and uh, so the idea that now people were going to know that I'm gay, I felt like no one was going to mm-hmm. hear my story anymore. No one is going to pay me anymore. Yeah. So. Uh, I almost like committed suicide. Like, just I just didn't want to leave, and I was like, I've had enough. I just don't want to deal because I I'd see I could see how like gay people were treated, mm, like, and so yeah. forth. And yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so I went to um, my school counselor, a psychologist, uh, Denise Zach. She's actually one of my good friends yeah. today. Uh, and uh, so I just opened up. I told her about everything and mm-hmm. she just so straightforward. straightforward she yeah. i told her about everything mm-hmm. and i told her you know the fears that i was having yeah. and that you know like i'm a public speaker now and mm-hmm. you know we don't you know like you know like this my i've grown up being told that being gay is wrong and yeah. i'm going to hell and so forth and Denise really helped me understand that there wasn't anything wrong with me. And mm-hmm. she helped me. At the time, I had already started getting some press about my work and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and she said, look what you've done. Look, you're changing people's lives. You're yeah. a good person and, and so forth. So that gave me strength. Yeah. But t- to answer the question, yes, I did seek counseling. And it was when I was struggling with my sexuality. Yeah. But also that gave me the opportunity to talk about my past as a survivor. Ah, uh, So you also, yes. but the same counseling, you were able to get that through basically yes, yes, okay yes, 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 yes. yeah because nowadays uh, seeking a psychiatrist is becoming a bit more mainstream yes, yes. and people are realizing that we have issues yes. but i'm always curious about the you know the generation of you and i who are like we are born innocent from the genocide yeah. but we have to carry the you know like the, the trauma yes. um maybe the difference between you and i is that i i had my parents so it took me a very long time before i understood indeed that there were other kids who looked at us and they got sad uh, yes. because my mother and my father were still alive and, and those kind of stuff but on the other hand i had to carry their, their yes, issues yes, because yes. they knew what, Just, was, yes. what was going on like even though maybe we were like safe and everything they had like a brother or sister Just who was dying or what it was in need and anyway so that's the trauma i'm, I'm kind of like always curious do the do you feel like all of like our generation would need would profit from uh, professional counseling uh, right now do you think it's needed or even like almost mandatory basically for a good health yeah I think it's it's uh, I would say that I think we all need to realize that life happens to all of us yes you know and uh, not only going through a thing such as a genocide or life just happens to yeah. us you know we lose jobs we are broke sometimes uh, we uh, we break up with our significant others yeah. and that's all things that we need to talk about yeah. and we experience a lot of pain different kinds of pain yeah. so yes I do recommend if you have there's nothing wrong with going to seek a therapist yeah. so that you can just usually what you do is they just lay you they should be they just let you talk because all we need is really just expressing, expressing yeah. what is happening to us yeah. and and also it's you know you express what's happening to you but also you have to be willing or wanting to heal you know Mm. so you know you can't just seek a therapist well that's just my own opinion (laughs) you just can't go to a therapist every you know forever you know there's a time that you need i call it graduation there's a time you need to graduate you know and you know but i highly 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 recommend seeking uh, a therapist uh, even a friend who is uh but just like opening up talking yeah. about your struggles and so forth with the goal of graduating graduating yeah <laughs> not always uh, staying in that circle in that moment yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so um i would like to talk to you about the next thing it's called yeah. forgiveness yes uh this is personally is, is i feel like it's the it's like the biggest export product that Rwanda has every country has its certain thing if you yes. think about skiing whatever you think about Switzerland you know every country has its own thing but Rwanda it's very popular right now on the map mostly because of the genocide that happened right. Right. and secondly because somehow some way Rwandans have been able to move forward now right now there is of course like a debate where not everyone is on the same level thing like not everyone is able to grieve well um, uh, some people think maybe they are not being forgiven, but in the big majority, Rwandans 
have been able to forgive, right? Would you agree with that? I think I would agree with that, yes. Yeah, and you like uh, you are like a, almost like a poster child of what happened in the genocide, you know, being an orphan, losing your parents, your siblings. Uh, so in my mind, I'm thinking for you to move on, you must be able to forgive. Yes. How did you do that? I think it was a journey. You know, I think forgiveness is like a journey. Yeah. You know, it's not something that happens right away. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, for me, I think, again, I think once I realized that I needed to take care of myself yeah. uh, and uh, uh, just, uh, you know, make peace with, you know, I can't change the fact that, you know, the genocide has happened. I can't yeah. change that my mom and dad have been killed, my sisters and many other family members and what's happened to the country. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, and also I can change that, you know, some, you know, family members abused me or other people may have done me wrong. Uh, just, I think for me, it was a journey that I went through, uh, anger, sadness, and so forth. Uh, but slowly, again, I did it for me, you know, you, when I think when you're trying to forget, you do it for yourself. Yeah. You know, but you see, but yeah. it's, sorry, I have to yeah. interrupt, yes. because that's the counterintuitive thing yeah, yeah. like someone has killed your mother in front of your eyes right. and now god forbid you come them across in front of you yeah. and and now you have to think like if i forgive them it's for myself how does how can you explain that how is that i was forgiving something you do for yourself because it allows me to move on with my life mm -hmm. i'm i'm not the one who you know who it's for me to move on with my life and mm -hmm. to you know you know what you what you did is about you yeah. you know like it's you know because most of the time it's like I, I you know you know when i used to speak people used to ask me do you blame you know blame so one of the things for me just for me i don't like blaming mm -hmm. uh like you know i like taking full responsibility for yeah. myself yes. you know because uh, i'm in the driver's seat i'm the one driving my life mm -hmm. uh so uh so it's about me and also i'm, I'm doing it so that I can just be at peace with my, you know, like yeah. I don't want to stay angry at somebody because yeah. they did A, B, C, D. No, what you did is about you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I forgive you. Do we need to be friends? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Do I have to talk to you? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. You know, if I feel like talking to you because maybe, but it's not, for example, if you, for example, those people who commit those crimes, yeah. like, for example, like you said, if I face I, don't, I, I wouldn't even want to. I don't want to. Yeah, you know, exactly. That's just me. Yeah. I, I don't want to. You yeah, know? Because, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I guess maybe some of us are lucky yeah, that yeah. we are able to leave the country. Yeah. So you get into a whole new world where you probably zero to maybe two Rwandans around you. Right. But for the many Rwandans who did stay in Rwanda, and this is yeah. a yes. topic that I'm really yes. interested about, yes. maybe to explore in the yes. future. Um, yeah, it, it was your neighbor, yes. you know, yes. or it was even someone from your own family, you yes. know, who, who killed you or tried to kill you. Yes. Um, how, so that's maybe it's a philosophical question yeah. right now because we did not live that life. But how can you forgive someone who you still have to be around basically? So for me, I'm, I'm in a sense, I'm kind of like in a sense that I left. Yes. So like I wouldn't be able to, that would be probably a good question for somebody who yeah. stayed and had to deal yeah, with, exactly. you know, yeah, I, never, I, yeah, I yeah. never had to deal with that. But it, it, I, I, just by thinking about it, it's, it, it's tough, it's you tough, know, right? yeah. yeah, it's yeah. tough because if it was me, I would not want to engage with you whatsoever. Yeah. yeah whatsoever. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, yeah. 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 No, this is the legacy that I feel like Rwandans. I mean, they, our generation, I call it the rebound generation. Yeah. We are the one rebounding from what happened. Yeah. And um, yeah, like you, like you said, it, it, it's tough. I'm, I'm, I acknowledge it's tough ever yes. since I came back to live to Rwanda. Yes. And I'm realizing, well, some of these people, they might go to the bank yes. and then they, they recognize that person. Yeah. And that person might have gone to jail, right? They have yeah. done their duties. They have been punished. But you still have to deal with them. Right. You still have to talk with them. But so... Yeah, that's a t topic it's, for another. It's, yes, it's tough. It's, yeah. it's, it's tough indeed. It's very challenging. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But, um, you know, but like I said, your story is very inspiring because seeing someone like you and what you're doing and also publicly what you're doing, it's, it's kind of, it, it gives hope. So with your experience, um, I know you, in, in some of the interviews you talked about you were not kind of like ready to come back to Rwanda. Yes. And then you, one day you came back to Rwanda. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, what made you come back to Rwanda for the very first time after leaving all of these horrible things behind? 
That's a good question. You know, I used to say in my speaking engagements, I used to get angry, actually. Mm. <laughs> you know, uh, people would ask me, so are you ever going back to, you know, Rwanda and try to do what you do here yeah. in the U.S.? And so I of said, never. I don't want to do anything, you know, yeah. with, uh, with Rwanda and so forth. But uh, uh, I first came back to Rwanda in 2014. I had lost my brother, my big brother. Yeah. So I came for his funeral. Uh, and then I went back, and then I th- I, in 2019, so I, I you know I've, I've pretty much had a successful career in in the philanthropic sector now, and uh, but I was feeling very stuck, and I wasn't really happy, you know, you know like I, I like I'm a hard worker, yeah. and uh, in uh, uh, when I was I think 25, 26, mm-hmm. I. Uh, uh, bought uh, my first house yeah. and I had been living in that house for like six years or so mm-hmm. and I was just like not happy anymore and I just wanted to after something. you bought the house yes, you are yes. not happy I was not happy at all <laughs> <laughs> I was not happy at all and I just needed something you know different like I just wanted to challenge myself so mm-hmm. you know I saw the house and I gave away all my belongings mm. and I packed up and I came to Kigali. I came to Rwanda. 2019? 2019, yes. And guess who also came back to Rwanda in 2019? 2019. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, it is crazy. For Personally, I came to Rwanda also um, kind of in search of uh, identity, of yeah. an idea. I would say it kind of you know revolves around that. Like, I don't know how America was, but I grew up in the Netherlands and there. It's a totally different culture from from what you would know. It's yeah. totally new language, new customs, everything new. So after growing up for so many years, you just realize, you know what? I've, I've done my best, I've succeeded, but I'm just not, I'm not from here. Right. So coming back to Rwanda was kind of some, some kind of like a finding my identity. Yes. Yeah. Have you been able, since you've come back, what is like the biggest um, progress that you've booked in your life ever since you came back? Uh, I think it's just really, you know, I think just, you know, being proud of where I was born and raised and Mm -hmm. being proud of my country. You know, I think for a very long time, I was just like very angry and very like, I just didn't want, I just wanted to stay away from, you know, things that were reminding me of the, you know, things that happened in the past. So being able to face, Mm -hmm. you know, all the fears that I was fearing, you know, has helped me. Like, I think that's the biggest thing, just being being present and just go, you know, facing what I was fearing. Because I think when I, when, when I would get angry about when people ask me a question about going back to Rwanda, doing my, I think I was just fearing yeah. the fear of the unknown. Like, how what, how am I going to react when I see things that remind me of the... And, and, you know, where, and where did this yeah. fear come from? Uh... I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure there is some. There's an explanation. To, I'm sure one of our, your viewers, who is a psychologist, <laughs> yeah. who, who who understands. I think it's just uh, I do suffer from PTSD. Yes. Uh, so I think uh, sometimes when you, uh, I think it, you, you don't want triggers that brings you back to those moments. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have, you have not had any any of those triggers ever since you came back. Uh, I've had some. You've yeah, had some. Yeah, and yeah. how did you deal with them? Um, uh, friends and family. Yeah. yeah. So they're very supportive. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're very supportive. It's it's one of those things where like you know you just have to to uh, have uh, people who care about you who are able to like you know be there for you yeah. you know and just show you love and and also you know sometimes also like. People don't understand, you know, but it's so it's my responsibility. So for, for in my case, I had to, you know, teach my, you know, my Rwandan family here and so forth, who you are not really familiar with all these things, you know, PTSD, depression yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. and so forth. I had to explain, well, this is what happens when you you've been through so much. And, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because <laughs> just in theory, you think that half of the country right now has PTSD, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? But we don't really talk about it, you know. Yes, and yes. there's no real. In my mind, I always thought that if someone wants to come back to Rwanda and really do something great, yeah. they should open like a big ass practice, like psychology yeah, practice, yeah. because there's enough clients right, here. Right, yeah, absolutely. Well, they would have to be open to it because that's another thing. There is a. I don't, know, I don't know what to call it, but there is a, I don't know, a stigma, stigma. Uh, yeah, of like, like 
therapy is for like yeah uh, i would just say therapy is for white people yeah you know like true, yeah. you know or it's or it's like it's uh for the rich people or yeah. it's for the you know the the people who you know but it's for everyone really. yeah it like, is it is know, yeah oh yeah it's funny that you said because i in my undergrad i did study um, something related to to therapy it's called yes. psychomotor therapy yes. it's like therapy yes. but then uh, uh, geared towards movement because yes. that's my main domain that i studied in and so when I came back, back to Rwanda, I came there to do like an internship and I was looking for ways and I, and, I, and I came to the conclusion, you know what? Yes, this is a very good, big opportunity, but there's too many clients. Right. There's too many clients <laughs> for you to, to deal with. You need to come with, with like, an, like something that can cover like the whole country or something yeah. like that because yeah, yeah, it is, it is, it, the stigma is there, but I do, my personal opinion, I do feel like we are so traumatized that I don't think we would we'll, we'll care where this help comes from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If we can find a way to deal with it, you've been able to deal with yeah. it through having a counselor yeah. at, your, at your high school or, or grad school. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the, the yeah. key is wanting, wanting to heal, yeah. you know, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, be better emotionally, emotionally, emotionally and so forth. You know, I, I'll tell you, I had an episode recently where I, I was, uh, you know, uh, arguing with, not arguing, but we were, we had a conversation and then I went and brought up things that we, you know, they've said they're sorry for, they've, mm -hmm. you know, apologized for, but I went and brought it back again. Yeah. So I was like, you know what, going forward, you know, I won't bring that up again because mm -hmm. we've, you know we've talked about it yeah. you've asked for you know you said sorry like a hundred times yeah. like why do i keep what do i continue to bring it back yeah. so i like you know sometimes we have to take responsibility for mm -hmm. some of our you know it's yeah. like you know what going forward i'm not gonna bring that up yeah. anymore and you know okay know. yeah just thought i was sharing <laughs> <laughs> no that, but that is that is truly un an underlying trauma you yeah, need yeah. to bring those things yes, up and yeah. and some wounds you know they are they can heal yeah, on the surface, yeah, but yeah, it did, did, did. <laughs> deeper it is. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I guess we can. Uh, it's it's an interesting topic. Yeah. Now let's talk about your your work actually. Yes. The Daniel Trust uh, Foundation, the the foundation that has awarded me with a million Rwandan <laughs> francs. Um, yeah. So from what I get, yeah. in 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 layman's term, is yeah. basically your business model is about giving back. Yes. Yes. And I want to talk about you and giving back. Yes. And in, in particular, there's some, one person that you mentioned in your interviews. I would like you to tell me what she means to you, right. Miss Kathy Silver. Yeah, 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 yeah. What does she mean to in your life, and how does she relate to you giving back? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when I moved from Zambia to the United States, as you can imagine, I was very like that's also like a, a different kind of trauma where <laughs> you just go to like. A different country yeah. uh, but uh, you know you have to like learn about everything yeah. about everything and as a 16 year old you know still like you know traumatized and so forth having to learn you know be better at English and so forth uh, Kathy Suva was uh, my arts teacher mm -hmm. and we became very very close uh, because she had a big heart for her, her students yeah. uh, and she introduced us to a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, and she you know, would take us horse riding. She would, you know, on Thanksgiving, during the holidays, you know, some of our families don't really celebrate Thanksgiving. So she said, hey, come on over at my house. So we'll all go to her house in New Haven. And, you know, when I went to study abroad in Paris, she let me, you know, borrow her camera mm -hmm. so I can take pictures. Like when I was graduating from high school, to going to prom, yeah. you know, she wrote me a check for $100 and said, hey, Daniel, I know, you know, mm -hmm. hey, it's tough. So, yeah. so she really, and not only that, she did all these things, but she was just naturally a good person yeah. who just wants to do good. And uh, not only Kathy Silva, there are also other wonderful people that I met, like Marge Hiller, mm -hmm. who run uh, a, a, a charity yeah. or like an organization similar to what I do, mm -hmm. and really just took me under her wing, and she gave me like uh, she well she made it possible for me to receive like a ten thousand dollar scholarship, mm -hmm. and also a laptop and uh, and mentorship. Okay. So uh, like my work really now is a reflection of my experiences when I when I was in high school and in college, and yeah. I, I felt like. I could do something like that too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's you, like I said. You you are a bit of a different giver. I would say in the world, right? Because yeah. most of the time when we think about people giving money, the people who are 
well off, yeah, they are rich. Yeah, 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 yeah. But looking at you and looking at your story, people will be like, wait, don't you need the money yourself? <laughs> right, um, right. So yeah, how, like, how, how, um, how did you start, first of all? Like, how does one start a, a, a foundation of uh, basically giving money? Because I know you started in giving out a scholarship yes. to uh, underprivileged uh, yes. minorities. Yes. Um, like, how did, how did you start such a business? Yeah, so, you know, again, because of my experiences, I, I wanted to do something to give back. You know, before, like, a long time ago, I used to say I'll open up orphanages mm -hmm. and, and uh, help, you know, orphan kids and, and teach them and so forth. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when I was in college, I went to Haiti, like, uh, to volunteer. Yeah. And I had an orphanage. Yeah. And I saw how the programs are run and so forth. And after that, I was like, oh, I don't think I want to, uh, you know, open up an orphanage. And that's when I think I started doing scholarships. But how does one start a foundation? I think one, uh, I think it, it has to come from, it's, it's a passion. You can't really do, if you want to get rich yeah. or want to, you know, you can do this work. Yeah. And if you don't have uh, uh, determination and ambition and, and uh, you know, uh, like if you're not a hard worker, it's yeah. not going to happen. Uh, so starting a foundation is really like starting a business. Yeah, exactly. Yes, so that's, yes, the, yes. that's the interesting thing about it. Because I want to talk. Of, I want to ask you also because people watch yes. this are also business savvy people. Yes, yes. Like, how is the is the foundation profitable? Like, do you yes. make a profit from and how do you, and how how does that work? So a foundation is allowed to make a profit, but it doesn't go back to the the founders or the CEO or the employees. It goes back into the company. It goes okay. back into the foundation. So you know the money is not distributed. So for for example for-profit organizations companies when there's a profit mm -hmm. you know you send share or you send uh, uh payouts to investors and so yeah, forth shareholders and, and shareholders and so forth in when you're running a non-profit such as a foundation mm -hmm. the money does not leave the 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 organization it stays uh, in the organization okay yes so basically it's like a it's like a loop with self-feeding loop so the more profitable you are yeah the more money you have to you, give you, the more money you have yes absolutely yeah so it's you know like i said like a, a foundations like a, the only difference is that we don't have anything tangible that we are selling like we're not selling a product we're not yeah. selling an iphone we're not selling anything or a service uh yeah. we we do have services that we provide but we don't sell them we provide them at no cost yeah, exactly. uh, and that's so our product really is the services that we provide, the programs that we create. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, and well, this took me a long time to understand, yeah. you know, but how I started really was uh, I went to school for business. I think that's very important to understand. Mm -hmm. I went to school for business yes. and I worked in the banking industry for six years yeah. uh, in different capacities in retail banking. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I loved my job and I loved helping people like teaching them uh, about their, you know, checking accounts, their savings accounts, how they can buy homes and how yeah. they can improve their credit scores and how they can better their lives yeah. and so forth by budgeting, by making sure that they spend less than they earn yeah. and making sure. So I loved all that. You did this order at a bank? Yes, I did this. Yeah, I, I didn't know that a bank did that, man. I, I, I thought really they... don't talk much about my banking history. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I thought I just bank take your money and, <laughs> and that's it. No, no, no. I, I, yeah. So I, I, yeah, uh, I don't talk much about my banking history because it doesn't really you know like I don't really talk much about it but I yeah. spent six years really learning uh, about you know the financial services industry I actually thought I was going to be a vice president eventually senior vice president at the organization yeah. that I worked for who the big supporters of my work which is great yeah. right, right now but uh, uh, so I to start I took because I, I was working full-time yeah. I went to school full-time and I went in car I went to college full-time okay. uh, and many young people who are low income like myself I grew up we tend to do that because we have to support ourselves yeah. so when it was time for me to make a big move to show people that you know I've created a foundation and you need to support my work mm -hmm. I took money out of my own savings account it was like five thousand mm -hmm. dollars it was in 2014 mm -hmm. and I gave four thousand dollars to eight students okay. uh, and I gave one thousand dollars to another a teacher who had impacted my life but prior in 2013 I had taken one thousand dollars from my savings account and gave it to Kathy that was in 2013 okay. Kathy Silva just because I just felt like yeah, I needed to recognize it, yeah. her. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good thing because yeah, yeah, yeah. you know now we know that teachers are really underpaid basically. Yeah, yes, so yes. I can imagine what this fund yeah. uh, 
meant to them yeah so that's how like I w that's how it started and yeah. then i created uh from creating the scholarship program i realized that students they just don't need money they also need mentorship mm -hmm. that's how we brought in a, a mentoring program mm -hmm. uh, and also the teacher recognition program which i had created to recognize teachers so i shifted from recognizing my own teachers and started having our students recognize their own teachers yeah, yeah. so and how uh so in, in my life, I always believe that two, two type of, when it comes to money, there are two yes. type of problems, right? There's too much money and there's not enough money. Yeah. So when it comes to foundations, I'm looking at your history at least, yeah. you've done a, a bunch of projects right. uh, where you kind of basically gave out money. Right. And for me, what I find very interesting, you in the last few years, I think you've shifted to Rwanda. Because right. you started giving scholarship in America, now you, you've come to Rwanda, yeah. which I absolutely love right. and makes, of course, sense maybe seeing where you, you, where you come from. Right. Um, how so? What, what, how, how has this been going? Like since you you started the Ronda venture and, and giving because I believe you gave like a hundred thousand dollars to like ten people or something. Yeah, I did that last year. Yeah, but that was last year. That was the create a foundation for me to discover you. Ah, okay, yes. So, so how how what was your experience in that? And did um, uh, yeah? Did you get any uh, positive feedback from that? Yeah, yeah. So I think I have to mention that I still we still do our programs in the U.S. Okay. Our programs in the U.S. are still running still as going, as usual. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I go back and forth between the U.S. and Rwanda to yeah. manage all that. Uh, and uh, uh, in Rwanda, we are just starting, uh, you know, our work here. Like yeah. I said, and. Uh, it's true, yes, last year we gave away like uh, a million uh, Rwandan front to 10 uh, young entrepreneurs. Yeah. We did it through social media. Yeah. And that was an experiment that we did to see, you know, and most of the young people wanted to, they didn't have any existing business. They wanted yeah. to start something. To start something. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's very hard. I, it's very hard to really, uh, you know, because I think... Uh, entrepreneurs usually f like their business their first business usually fails you know like usually, yes, yes. <laughs> you know yeah uh, and so I think from that experience I think we wanted to uh, we wanted to support existing businesses so people who have a track record you know uh, of doing something and that's how I uh, again I'd, so I, I for your audience who are watching mm -hmm. so i had been following you online yes. on, on on youtube and so forth and uh, i had been watching your videos and i you know I, I could see how you were hustling and you know trying to uh you know you're also hustling you know with uh, trying to open your gym yeah. and opening it and then having covid 19 just like shut everything out yeah. and i saw how you're, you're also trying to fundraise you know for the gym yes. and uh, and you're creating content online which it you know it's it's not uh, free it's it's it, it you know you have to spend a lot of resources and time yeah. doing all this work and you know and i found a lot of value in in your content mm -hmm. uh and the last video that you did you know is it the rwandan genocide or is it the rwandan genocide against the tutis yes. so i had already i had been meaning to like I have to support him, you know, like yeah. I support him. And so that video purpose, you have to support him. That's, yeah. <laughs> you know, and also not only that, I had, I had also like, you know, cause the last I had done, I had given like the, you know, the 10 entrepreneurs, I had supported them. Yeah. I was like, I was thinking about doing like, again, another small business entrepreneurship kind of thing. Yeah. And I was like, he, that's him like that's I, I we have to support him we have yeah. to invest him and yeah yeah no I can see because he has a track record he yeah. has something that he's doing already I can I can go on his website yeah. I can uh, I, he has a videos I can go to yeah. uh, he has he there's something that I can you know look uh, can look to you know I, this actually reminds me it's it's sad but it's true when you're looking for to lend, to borrow money from the bank yeah. usually they don't lend to people who have who are not in who have not been in business for three or five years mm -hmm. like you know because again it's a big risk to invest yeah. in somebody who doesn't have a track you know a track record yeah that's true that's true yeah, yeah no i think uh, i think you're doing an awesome thing and uh, I, like i said for me it's i never expected it and it, to just help so as a recipient i can on, honestly say it was it's, it's a nice it's also a nice gesture and also double nice because I know these foundations usually they are geared towards the West. There's many places you can apply. You can even get double grants from left and right. But somehow here in Africa, we actually need the money the most. There are very little people like you who are here and are actually 
give the money directly to the person. Right, they, right. They're usually some so, other, so, yes, yes, some yes, organizations yes. in between, they yes. apply in the name of you, but yeah. of course they take their cards. Yes. So, <laughs> so it's, it's nice. You know, I learned that from, uh, you know, I mentioned a woman by the name of Marcella. She was yeah. very, you know, uh, uh, influential in everything that when I started doing the foundation. Yeah. Uh, she said the best way to do is the recipient. Uh, so our scholarships, we don't send them to the university. Mm -hmm. we, s we give them directly to the recipient. Okay. Yeah, because when you send the scholarships to the university, the university reduces their financial aid. Uh, so you know, so I even I learned that from even it happened to me as well when I was younger. Mm -hmm. So my mindset has always been like, I'm not going through. I'm not gonna go through some sort of organization or some sort of person to get to somebody that I want to invest in. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm going to invest in somebody, I'm gonna make sure that it goes directly to the person that we want. That yeah, fund. yeah. No, I can I can definitely yeah. vouch for that yeah. indeed, and it's yeah, uh, yeah it's nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so we are heading towards the end of this interview. Yes. It's going yes. rather well. I just have like two topics. Yes. One is a major one. I think you alluded a little bit. Let's talk about your your sexuality. Yes. You said in 2010 you found that you are very much gay. <laughs> yeah. How does one find that they are gay at, at age? What is it like? 13, 14? Oh, well, not I. I knew it but i didn't have a name for it but um, okay. when i was 21 that's really like you know i would say like uh, uh you know like that's when when you're growing and you like you know your feelings start you know like yeah. becoming real but so you know so so I, I, so as someone who's very much heterosexual yes. i've actually been told by some women that i'm too heterosexual that i need to calm yeah. me down yeah. but how does one like how, what was the thing that you noticed uh, and at what age maybe that you are like different from I guess the majority of the guys. Well, I mean, when I was younger, you know, uh, when I was younger, uh, I used to play with girls all the way. Okay. Yeah, I hated playing with the boys. Why? What's wrong with boys? There's nothing wrong with boys, but I just wanted to, I enjoyed do, playing with, be, hanging out with the girls and so forth. Yeah. And uh, kids would make fun of me at school and, okay. uh, and, uh, and, and they would just call me all this, you know, they call me Chava Cobra and stuff yeah. like that. And, you know, you know, I look at that, I'm like, well, hmm, look at me now, like, I'm winning, like, you know, because like, yeah. those, at, at that age, like, when yeah. people call you such names, like, it hurts, yeah, you know, course, yeah. but now I look back, I'm like, hmm, okay, I'm winning, like, yeah. I, I, I hope, you know, it's one of those things where, like, you know, you just, like, I'm succeed. I'm comfortable with who I am, like, I am happy, I am at peace, yeah. uh, but, uh, but again, it took, uh, it took, uh, uh, people usually know we usually know but we we deny it we deny, we it, deny yeah. it and we know like within us you know mm -hmm. like and so forth but because of like you know religion plays a big thing where you know oh it's not allowed you know marriage is only supposed to be between a man and a woman mm -hmm. but you know bs yeah. you know uh and uh so i i am so so proud of myself to especially here in rwanda yeah. uh to be able to live my truth and you know without being apologetic about it yeah. like and and being proud and and that's what i would hope that uh uh you know I, I i just hope and pray that there will be one there where young gay people mm -hmm. lesbian young women or like transgender people where they can just live their life freely yeah. without being afraid of the judgment from their families from the society mm -hmm. uh, because we all have something to contribute yeah, definitely. Uh, and uh so i just uh you know pray and hope and i hope that there are other young gay people lesbian <laughs> you know people who from rwanda yeah. who just you know say what enough is enough and yeah. you know and usually what happens i think once you uh you know it's 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 very challenging but i think i just hope it we get there you know yeah yes. no, i like uh personally like i grew up in amsterdam most of my life and there we had like the gay parade yeah so uh, i like having gay people around me at a young age yeah. uh, taught me to kind of like evaluate that you know like yeah. like i'm a typical guy in that sense of like i did not like gays and i had to think about it. why i did not like gays and yeah. i i found that later at ages because <laughs> you won't believe it most guys are actually afraid of gays because they feel like gay is something that you can like transmit so it's been, yeah. you know like so if you hang around gay guys you yeah. might become gay like yeah. that it's, it's like a trust me yeah. 
it's a whole masculinity issue that we have there. But you know, like I said later on, I also I just realized, you know what? I'm actually I'm never gonna become gay, no matter right. what, no matter right. what happened. Right. Right. But so ever, ever since I came to Rwanda, <laughs> I I used to laugh. I came back to Rwanda once with my little brother, and then we would walk in the streets and we'd see men holding hands yeah, in yeah, hand. Yeah, you know, yeah. but <laughs> we knew that gay you know gayness in Rwanda was kind of not talked about. Talked about yeah. But also these people holding hands, they were not per se gay, right? Yeah. But they were doing all these things that we knew that gay people normally do. Um, but so actually, I'm, I'm, personally, I'm really interested in this topic <laughs> because right. seeing where Rwanda has come from, right? Um, now we, we like I said, our biggest export product is really forgiveness. Yeah. Um, yeah, like what are, have you faced any challenges of being gay in Rwanda? Uh, because I know that they are yeah. worldwide. Yeah. But I've just never seen them in Rwanda. Yeah, that's right. So I've, I, you, you know, to me personally, I've never experienced any challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm pretty known here. Like, uh, yeah. it, you know, I don't go into uh, a taxi or into a shop without somebody saying Dana Trust Foundation. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe it's it's a privilege that I have. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's a it privilege, is, yeah. uh, and it's. Uh, so I haven't really faced any challenges personally because yeah. again I'm very confident about who I am. There won't be a person who is going to come and tell me, uh, you know, you know, I'm coming and saying I'm destroying the culture and mm -hmm. be quiet. I'm going to be like, uh, so I'm gonna like, I'm gonna respond. I'm going to yeah. in a respectful way, intelligent way. Yeah. But I do have lots of friends here who are gay who suffer every day, yeah. uh, who are really emotionally destroyed because they cannot be themselves publicly yeah. and it's like they feel like they need to hide and, yeah. and but what's what's uh, what's what's stopping them from being gay publicly the culture yeah. the culture uh the the mucho uh at the, you know they, they're just like they, they are called lots of names and no one wants to be called a name yeah. you know oh look at that gay person yeah. uh like you know oh, I'm yeah. at, you know this and this and that oh naga tingani you know that uh yeah. you know so it's 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 not something it reminds me when i was a child yeah. you know those kids calling me those names yeah. you know thankfully i became so i just uh we need our culture need to be more supportive so perhaps mm -hmm. maybe one day even laws yeah. that protect gay people mm -hmm. you know Do you uh, think that's, that's needed in rwanda it's needed everywhere yeah because discrimination happens everywhere yeah that's true. you know discrimination yeah. it's needed everywhere like yeah. you know because we know from it's not something that um you know it's we know that discrimination happens and we know i have friends here again who are afraid for their lives to you know uh just to be themselves you know yeah. there are some who are out which is great they should continue doing that i, I admire them uh and they should continue doing setting a good example yeah. uh, but for those who have yet to accept themselves but i think culturally uh, we need to shift the mindset uh, and it's, I think actually we're a good example like Uganda is a good example where acceptance right yeah, exactly, like you know yeah. like I think we should set a good example not only for you know things that have happened in the past but also for the current yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so yeah uh, my question to that is indeed um, yeah in my personal experience I think from what, what I also know in Rwanda that uh, you will not be beaten on the streets yes, because you're gay. Yeah. And even if you steal something, that's uh, and, and people catch you and they start beating you. You can still almost sue those people who beat you, even if you are a thief, yeah. because the whole acts of violence towards others it's kind of like not done anymore here yeah. in here in Rwanda. But I guess I must applaud you for being, you know, like um, like a, a, a genocide survivor who has. You know, you, are, you you've made it, like you said. You know, you you've you've gone to the other side. And back, and you're giving back, yeah. and you you are proud of your sexuality, and are you know free to walk out there. So I'm sure you must be an inspiration to many of other people who 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 have had a similar past like you. And knowing Rwanda, at least there are probably thousands of those out there. I hope so. <laughs> no, I know so. So yeah. looking looking uh, uh, to the future, yeah. for you right now, the, the the stage where Rwanda is in 2021. What does Rwanda now mean to you? 
what does Rwanda mean to me? I th- you know, I used to say like, you know, like America was home, yeah. you know, but Rwanda is home, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. Rwanda is home. Yeah, and we can be both. Yeah, both. Yeah, Rwanda is home. And it's uh, I'm very proud of how far we've come as a country, mm-hmm. good leadership in government uh, and uh, just really setting a good uh, example for the world. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, just like so proud, you know, yeah. of like the, the progress, you know, yeah. and and, and 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 I just you know, uh, and I, I want you know, you know our generation, young people, to be proud to be here, and I hope that you know more opportunities. I hope that some billionaires decide to you know start investing in lots of like education in youth, you know, yeah. and providing employment opportunities and so forth. Yeah. And uh, but I'm very very proud of Rwanda and yeah. to be Rwandan. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, that's good to hear. So. Before we end, um, okay. The last question is, is gonna, I'm going to ask is the question that most people are interested who are watching this video yeah. is how can they also win one million one friends? <laughs> but before we get there, what what is the impact that you wish to reach with your foundation or with your future uh, plans uh, right now? Yeah. So I have uh, uh, a goal. My goal is to really become uh, very well known around the world not just in the Rwanda not just in the United States but around the world mm-hmm. uh, and uh, we are going to go we are going to do that through our philanthropy and through uh, just really through what we're doing now you know yeah. uh, and we're gonna continue doing that and once we become a successful uh, once we start uh, really securing the real dollars that really make a big difference mm-hmm. and we're going to invest more in young people in the United States, in Rwanda mm-hmm. and who knows what the future holds but mm-hmm. I want our work, my work to be an example for other, like you said like you want, you you know people who are in the diaspora who are abroad, the Rwandans who are abroad yeah. come back to your country if you have a skill yeah and so forth come back and contribute to the development of the of the uh, of the country and that's you know again that's why I, I was very fascinated with your story because I saw a lot of like similarities yeah. and I saw a lot of uh, you know uh, it doesn't mean that everybody that we're going to support in our work we have to have similarities yeah. no but uh, like uh, so as we see ourselves becoming an example role model for mm-hmm millions of people around the world mm-hmm. yeah well well done uh, daniel so you 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 you're doing great uh i wish you for you to continue now for the viewers out there who are watching who are also interested in in in, in making a million around the front, how can uh, they that's, apply that's, that's a good yeah uh so the, the our small business grant program uh is by invitation only for now uh because we have to make sure that we identify uh, like I did research on you. I knew everything about you before I reached out to you. Yeah. That's I think that's what I would encourage your viewers. To, like, you know, do the work, mm-hmm. do the work, do it very well, yeah. and uh, and and for sure, send send me a message. Send me your your. Uh, I actually read every email that I get, mm-hmm. every DM that I get. Um, so introduce me to your work okay. if i don't respond to you it's not because i don't want to but send me your work put me in your awareness yeah. and then let me track you just like you know like i track you do research on if you're doing good work yeah. i will reach out at, if at the right time at the right moment our, we our team reaches out to you yeah yeah but i, I would hope maybe maybe in the near future will open up an, an application where people can go and submit their project submit, yeah. for now because it's still new it's it's by invitation only yes okay. awesome daniel thank, thank you very much thank you. this was like a lovely interview thank you for sharing your story once again and or oh, and i wish you uh, good luck and in, uh, in everything that you're doing and i'm sure you're gonna make it just uh, think about us when you're at the top uh, the the thing is mutual keep up the good work yes. thank you for having me thank you Big thanks to the Onomo Staff Hotel for providing such great service. Thank you my lovely Patreons and YouTube members for supporting me as always. If you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell notification. Give this video a like and like I said, if you need any information about Daniel, you can find it in the description below. Thank you for watching and listening. I'd like to see you in the next one. Okay.